Hey Joe, this week I'm going to talk to you about <laughs> Chapter 3 of The Innovator's Mindset by George Kuros. We're in week one of the book study on Seesaw and it's been a ton of fun. We got a great mix of people from people in our district, people outside our state, to people in elementary, high school, administration. Um, so we've got a lot of learning going on from people with different experiences than I have. I think Ms. Verdura did a great job of coming up with prompts to take our thinking uh, to a deeper level. Uh, but again, the most fun is in that comment section, uh, learning from the different experiences of people who are way different than what I'm used to. A few things jumped out to me from chapter three. What I'm gonna focus on are the eight characteristics of the innovator's mindset. I had planned on doing all eight, uh, and I wrote about those on the blog side of things, but just to save time, I think I'm just gonna focus on those first three. Here's the graphic that really stood out to me of those eight characteristics of the innovator's mindset. Um, now you can check out my blog to see it a little bit better. Um, and I'm just gonna be talking about those first three. Before we get to those, the first thing that drew my attention was the uh, sentence that explained what an innovator's mindset, where George says, innovator's mindset is the belief that the abilities, intelligence, and talents are developed leading to the creation of better ideas. And that goes to that growth mindset where it's all about you putting in the effort to improve yourselves and don't just make the excuse, oh, that's just how I am, uh, and instead push yourself to develop those skills. Uh, I made this little Instagram post. Oh, my kid's so cute, reading that dino book. What a dino nerd. Smart is not something you are. Smart is something you get from Stephanie Harvey. Um, and I think that's so huge, being able to develop those skills. Um, now, students, a lot of times, will try to make that excuse where, oh, I'm just not smart enough to do well in the class. Um, but what I've found in my class is the students who do really well tend to be the students who are willing to put in the effort to learn the material. And that's true even more outside of school, uh, where most jobs you get, you don't have to be smart to do those jobs. It's about how passionate you are about what you're doing and how much effort you put into doing a good job. And so those are skills we wanna develop in our students because that's gonna be super important for them moving on. Teachers are just as bad as the students when it comes to making excuses where they can say, oh, I'm just not creative enough to be innovative or it's just not part of my personality to be that outgoing or I'm not that much of a people person. Well, all of those things are not characteristics that you're stuck in forever. Those are all skills that you can work at and develop as you go. And so putting in the work and the effort to develop those areas of weakness is something that's huge. You can develop into the person you want to be. You're not stuck where you are right now. All right, so the first characteristic from the actual graphic is empathy. Now, I love watching Dads and Ed on YouTube uh, where Josh, Brent, and Devin uh, talk with different educators from around the country. Um, and one of the questions they always ask them is, how have you changed as an educator now that you've had a kid? So I've thought about that a lot. And how am I different as an educator uh, because of Briggs? Well, I'm definitely more tired, but he's definitely helped my Snapchat game. Uh, but seriously, I think he's actually helped me become more empathetic with my students. Instead of just getting angry at my students for misbehavior or when they get frustrated in class, is trying to see it from their perspective and realizing that biology might not be as shocking as it sounds, might not be the most important thing in their life um, and trying to understand where they're coming from. And that really helps solve a lot more problems than just getting angry. And then also taking it to the next level um, is how do I tie into what is most important and tie that into what I'm doing in my class. From the student side of things, empathy is super important, especially when we teach things like evolution or climate change where they might not have the same opinion as what science agrees upon and getting them to understand that you need to respect and understand people who think differently than you. And that's a super important skill that is not modeled by society very well, but it's going to be very important uh, as they get older. And understanding just because someone thinks differently than you doesn't make them worthless or make it okay for you to treat them however you want. They still want to be respectful to people who think differently. The second characteristic is the concept of a problem finder slash solver. Uh, one thing that I do with my students when we do labs, uh, for example, like a photosynthesis lab, is I will give them how to do the control group. So let's say four spinach leaves in the bottle for 10 minutes with the carbon dioxide probe to see how much CO2 the plants take out of the air during the 10 minutes. 
Um, so that'll be like the recipe lab that they have. And a lot of teachers will stop there. But what I do to help my students become better at problem finding and solving is once they're done with the control group is think about ways that they can make photosynthesis go even better. And they come up with the variables that they're going to test. And they always do a great job coming with things like temperature, type of leaves, color of leaves, um, color of light, type of light, amount of light. And then the students are a lot more invested in their uh, experimental groups when they're testing variables that they got to choose. For me as a teacher, the idea of a problem finder and solver is taking the concept of reflection to the next level where not only do you think about what could have gone better in your class, but you actually do something about it to make it better for the next year. I think it's very easy for teachers to say, oh, I'm super reflective because they're thinking about how to improve their lessons, but it's a lot harder to actually put in the work to make the changes to make your lessons better. The last one is risk takers. Um, and this is something that's really important to me because I do want to do things that I haven't tried before, which always feels super risky. Um, but George had a quote from the book that I really liked that said, an educator with an innovative mindset will find a balance between drawing on experience while maintaining a willingness to try something new. And just like most things in life, the key is defining that balance. I've found from teaching that my students really do crave some routine. Like I always start my class with a Kahoot and a warm up, but sometimes we're super scrunched for time. So I'll skip the Kahoot and my students will just like go insane. They're like, what? We can't skip this. How are we going to be ready to learn if we don't get to do what we always do? And they just like cannot handle that the routine is being adjusted. Um, so they do enjoy being able to anticipate and know what to expect in class. But on the other side of the coin, you don't want to get so stuck in a rut that it's monotonous and boring. So you do want to add in some different activities that they aren't expecting. Um, but again, it's find that balance between the structure and the adventure um, because students do crave both. I hope you enjoyed this week's episode of Educating Joe going through chapter three of the Innovator's Mindset. Feel free to like, share, comment, or subscribe. And to all you other Educating Joes out there, have a great week.